Thank you very much for having me. I want to start with a little bit of history. The origin of AI can be traced to cybernetics, the interdisciplinary study of communications and control, which had its heyday in 1940 and 1950s. Two of its pioneers, Warren McCullough and Walter Pitts, devised the first model for a neuron. In their simple model, a neuron receives inputs and has a threshold of activation to produce an output. Alan Turing had earlier developed the notion of Turing computability. Given a description of a computation, a program, and some data, a universal Turing machine will be able to produce the computation. If a digital computer is a Turing machine and a network of McCullough-Pitts neurons represents how the brain works, the conclusion was that computers could imitate the brain. Cybernetics remained a rather fringe field and never took off the way that artificial intelligence did as a distinct discipline in the 1950s. On the other hand, AI never succeeded in creating intelligent machines. This bit of history has an interesting Chile connection. After he finished his PhD in biology at Harvard in 1958, the celebrated Chilean scientist Humberto Maturana went to work at MIT. There, he conducted pioneering neuroscience research on the retinal processing of visual stimuli with none other than McCullough and Pitts, also Jerome Ledvin. The work was a complete departure from then current views about perception and showed that neurons act like feature detectors. Maturana returned to Chile soon after and he was part of the second wave of cybernetics between 1960 and 1985. In fact, the president of the American Society of Cybernetics published a letter of condolences when he died in May. The second connection uh, to Chile is Project Cybersyn. During the presidency of Salvador Allende, he nationalized large swaths of Chilean industry, particularly foreign-owned copper mines. Managing production in the newly centralized industries was a very tall challenge. Engineer and then high-ranking official of Corfo, Fernando Flores, asked the British cybernetician Stafford Beer for his help. They began an ambitious project to, ac to access production data in real time and use it to inform decision-making in managing the economy. This is 1971, so the tech was very rudimentary. The history of Project Cybersyn is fascinating in its own right, but I want to focus on one issue it brings to light, the relationship between technology and politics. It is a prime example of government using technology to advance the goals of its political project, as Ida Medina points out in Cybernetic Revolutionaries. Technologies really come about from the interplay between technological advances and social negotiation. This means that technologies are not value neutral, and ideologies play a role in shaping the design of technological systems. As AI research and development today is decidedly male dominated, it follows that male perspectives are pervading these technologies and their applications. So we have that AI assistants are female, like Siri and Alexa, but AI powered knowledge oracles like IBM Watson are male. The issue isn't only one of stereotyping, with 80% of AI professors and 90% of Google's AI workforce being male, the disparity is extreme. As such, the AI industry is advancing blind to half the population and AI-based products end up exacerbating societal inequalities. Think of the algorithmic filtering of job applicants. When Amazon built a hiring engine based on their own accumulated resumes over a decade, they ended up with a model that preferentially chose male candidates. Thankfully, Amazon scrapped the project, but AI supporting hiring is still pursued by other companies and could widen women's employment and pay gap. Women are underrepresented in data across the board, leading to pervasive bias that affects even non-AI products. Car safety and medical diagnosis are just two examples of the damages brought on by the gender data gap, brilliantly collected and narrated in the book Invisible Women. Because of this data gap, women are 50% more likely to be misdiagnosed when they are having a heart attack and 47% more likely to be seriously injured in a car crash. We must make the case for representation across the data we collect, across work and across educational opportunities. The world needs women in AI, not just to remind men to collect gender disaggregated data and build data models that are more fair. We need women to help decide which AI products get built and how AI enterprises are led and to vitalize the quest for fairness, transparency and accountability. 
AI is a subfield of computer science and the participation of women in computer science education has only gotten worse over the years. In the US, only 80% of computer science undergraduates were women in the year 2012, the most recent data available. Whatever the factors influence in this dire scenario, the stereotype of geeky and lonely coders or the first year computer science weed out courses, we might ask ourselves if data science and AI really need to be branches of computer science programs. At this juncture, the amount of specialization and the demand from employers justifies developing dedicated programs of study in AI, allowing even for a variety of specializations like robotics and data product engineering or ML ops. If we deploy new degree programs, we have the opportunity of designing and marketing them to attract women. Fundamentally, everyone involved should start by rejecting biological determinism that asserts women are inherently less fit for these subjects. Beyond educational initiatives, two key activities to develop and strengthen are mentoring and visibility for women in AI. This is where national and international women in AI associations can play a central role. It may not be sufficient, however, and we certainly need commitment at the level of national governments. In the United Kingdom, the Alan Turing Institute leads a women in data science and AI project. The country's data science and AI institute made a commitment to rectify gender inequality in these fields and uses its convening power to turn research and recommendations into concrete policy measures. The draft document of Chile's national policy in AI highlights the concern about the gender gap in AI, the gender data gap, and the bias manifested by trained AI models. It states objectives to promote participation of women in AI and gender equity in the development of AI-based systems. It's a start. Women's voices need to be in every room where decisions are made, whether it be about educational programs or methods, industry leadership and product design, government policy setting and regulation. Let's make this commitment. Recruit and train more women and sit them at every table. Thank you ever so much. <laughs>